Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the weekly Thursday meeting. I'd like to uh, heartily welcome uh, Dr. Sabia Sachi Sengupta to address us uh, regarding his uh, research, uh, how do we go about publishing. Uh, Dr. Sabia Sachi is a vitreo retinal surgeon practicing at uh, Future Vision Eye Care from Mumbai. He is currently the associate editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. Now, this is your time to actually put out him and uh, see what you can do to get your papers published in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. He got a diploma from uh, Jipmer and a DNB from Arvind Pondicherry. He also did his uh, research from clinical fellowship from Shankar Netalia and also research fellowship from uh, Wilmer I Institute, John Hopkins. Uh, he was awarded the McCartney Prize for the Royal College of Ophthalmologists London and he was the first ever non-British national to receive this award. He also received uh, Dr. G. Venkat Swami gold medal in DNB Ophthalmology in 2009. He was head of research at Darwin Pondicherry from 2014 to 2016. He has over uh, 100 plus papers in index peer reviewed journals. And uh, he is founder of uh, Sen Gupta's Research Academy, which you can all use uh, if you are a, a newbie and uh, if you want to publish. Over to you, Dr. Sen Gupta. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. And thank you so much to everyone for this opportunity to come and interact with all of you. Uh, so if you can we stop all, your... Uh, then... Stop sharing, yeah. yeah. And he's also fondly uh, called a Sunny to all of us who interact with him uh, more frequently. So, uh, for those of you who are wondering who is Sunny and if he keep referring, it is uh, Sabhisachi. And uh, we've uh, worked on a couple of projects and I'm uh, hoping to continue to work with uh, Sunny. He's uh, extremely good at uh, uh, also uh, the work that he's doing at uh, IGO. So, on behalf of all of us here, congratulations to you and the team for the fantabulous increase in the impact factor. I, I think it's it's really nice uh, that an Indian journal is doing so well and an ophthalmology journal has got such high an impact factor. So we don't need to see any further. Uh, today also I had a fellow coming and asking me, uh, you know, how do I submit a video to the uh, journal? And uh, I think it's the only journal uh, to have a video journal that is uh, indexed. So I think all of us should make more use of that. Over to you, Sunny. Thank you so much, uh, Chaitra. And uh, you know, it's a great privilege to be here and you know, to sort of discuss a few things with you. Let me quickly share my screen. All right. So, you know, I thought we'll discuss a little bit about uh, you know why we should do research. Uh, you know, a lot of people will teach you how to do it, and you know, there are a lot of ways to learn it. But uh, you know, I think that why is really important in terms of. Uh, uh, you know anything we start in life any venture we start in life or you know wherever, wherever we get want to get to that why is really important and i think that is the major driving force uh, that you know helps us as we go along so i thought uh, you know i'll share the why for me as well as you know a lot of those may be applicable to a lot a lot many of you so you know let's look at you know why we should do this uh, so you know basically what is the motivation and you know what is uh, what is the payback so I think uh, I've been already <coughs> introduced, uh, so you know, we won't go much into the details. And I think overall, I usually like to start with an inspiration and uh, you know, it's very important to uh, sort of uh, you know, ask, keep asking questions all the time in clinics as well as uh, you know, if you're in the lab. You know, the questions you ask define who you are and not the answers you know. Uh, so you know, we need to push the boundaries of what we know and uh, sort of try and uncover what we don't know. And, you know, most of them will lead into very impactful research papers. Uh, you know, so I'm going to show you a quick clipping which has inspired me over the years. Uh, it's from a Hindi film, and I, you know, I hope a lot of you have seen it. So you know, we'll take this has really you know been at the back of my mind uh, over a decade, and you know, hope you will uh, sort of also identify with it. Pal ek naya samadhi khilin gahi 
जो अपनी आंखों में हैरानियां लेके चल रहे हो तो जिंदा हो तुम दिलों में तुम अपनी बेताबियां लेके चल रहे हो तो जिंदा हो तुम सो ही सेज दिलों में अपनी बेताबिया लेके चल रहे हो तो जिंदा हो तुम सो फॉर मी यू नो दैट दैट यू नो दैट बेताबी और दैट सॉर्ट ऑफ ट्विंकलिंग माई आई हैज बीन ऑल अबाउट रिसर्च एंड आई एम श्योर यू नो यू आर ऑल्सो इन एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन विच इज हैवीली इन टू दैट कैन ऑफ एक्टिविटी सो आई एम श्योर यू नो लॉट ऑफ यू वुड सॉर्ट ऑफ यू नो आइडेंटिफाई विद दिस क्लिप uh you know but before we dive into all of this i really wanted to sort of you know take you through a, a sort of step back and look at a much larger picture and uh, you know think about how will medical practice look like in the year 2030 which is not really far away it's just a decade you know and time really passes quickly so how will you know we be doing things in 2030 There is an ever increasing desire to do scientific and clinical research and get published in the developing world. Come to Sengupta Research Academy e-learning portal and see how easy it can be to design and conduct a study, analyze data, write it up and publish by following a step-wise tried and tested approach. Learn, enjoy, spread the message and don't miss out on this great opportunity. I think the key word, sort of one word, if you want to uh, sort of uh, you know say how it is going to be is automations, and a lot of this is going to revolutionize the way uh, we uh, practice, right? So uh, you know, sort of just remember this dictum of don't don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, sort of sort of look, start looking at many different things that you can do, and uh, you know we are at a different you know these automations will go through different phases as we all know. These are all. you know uh, fundus photos taken by different cameras and uh, you know these uh, automated image analysis is nowadays happening and i think we are at the stage where we are uh, at ai assistance where you know we are using these as clinic you know decision support systems uh, we are not entirely dependent on them as yet but then you know we are going into a phase of part- partial automation where human beings are going to be required only for you know looking at some images and not all and this is not just you know uh, sort of restricted to images but it will go into a lot of decision making especially in non surgical branches uh, you know say diabetology or something which we which can actually entirely be automated and then you know by 2030 a lot of us are going to be into uh, full automations where you know these machines are not really going to need physicians assistance uh, insurance companies are largely going to depend upon uh, you know if you uh, you know i don't want to call the word disobey but you know if you do something different from what the ai is saying the insurance may not cover uh, claims and you know things like that so uh, we are slowly but surely heading into this uh you know and a time may come where surgical branches may also be uh, you know uh, lining up uh, you know we all know uh, you know a lot of surgeries which are not exactly robotic but very much automated like lot of uh, refractive surgeries mm, uh, you know and now we are doing 3 3 you know heads up 3d surgeries where the machine is actually recording pretty much all our motions so you know we are all probably heading towards that as well and we uh, you know ai is everywhere Uh, AI will change the interactions between doctors and patients, but most patients won't even know that it's involved, you know. And then slowly they will. So you know, this is I think where we are heading. So is this good or bad? You will ask, right? So I think it's good for patients. It's definitely good for patients. It, it's probably going to help us make better decisions, but probably not so good for physicians. You know, we know that these are pros and cons of this. But you know, if if a uh, lot of our services are not required, you know, where are we going to go? and you know this is a book uh, which i think all of us must read if you haven't uh, already this is the 21 lessons for the 21st century which is written by uh, you know yuval noah harari is one of probably the best thinkers of our times and he coins a term called edmed you know where e ed stands for education and and med stands for of course medicine and this is going to change and the ai revolution is really going to target edmed and that is where all the major changes are going to happen at least uh by 2030 you know so and uh, he clearly says how it will look in 2030 cannot even be guessed widely at present so he is a historian who looks uh, pa- in the past and predicts the future and you know he gives pretty uh, awesome you know he's got a very awesome way of explaining so you should all probably try and read this book so how can we be prepared i think ai integrations into medicine cannot be stopped you know all diagnostics medical fields diabetes etc like i already said it probably won't happen overnight but the good news is it this is still evolving and we can assist this evolution and be part of it rather than resist it rather than be against it uh, you know so yeah so the main question really is you know can i be part of this uh, whole process or uh, you know because this is happening and uh, you know will i be only the end user or can i actually facilitate or make these machines better uh, you know for that you need to think about breaking barriers you need to uh, you know go at breakneck speed 
and you probably need to discover things that you are not very comfortable with and start doing things which uh, you are not in your comfort zone right so there's another great book uh, you know uh, by michael o'grady he thinks it talks about think smart and work smart uh, you know it's and it he says don't work hard work smart you know and this is a great book in which he gives a lot of techniques of how you can do that so you know how you can be part of this is train yourself with data you know data is going to be the new currency as we go go ahead uh, you know learn analytics and statistics at least the basics of them learn to present your data well learn to write well make an impression you know so uh, what we are hinting of is uh, you know if you are good at uh, data analytics and and writing you know that essentially makes you a clinician scientist you know so if you are just a pure clinician and you know, the chances of you getting to be part of these revolutions is is remote if you are a clinician scientist and a good one at that the chances of you getting to be part of this is is quite high as you know you have live examples amongst you with dr vinaykar uh, you know dr rohit chetty dr chaitra doing a lot of work with you know many different uh, people who are uh, you know doing a lot of ai work so uh, you know think about being clinician scientist simulating some of the stars that are amongst you be a good you know so overall before we start is you know be a good uh, be good at medical research and be prepared for uh, tomorrow now and i have given this talk to a lot of uh, medical students in uh, undergraduate medical course uh, you know medical uh, students uh, the ugs and you know it's really an eye opener because they are actually going to be you know entering uh, super specialty or uh, into practice by 2030 and you know for them uh, and i'm sure for you know when even when i was reading the book it was quite an eye opener you know this is me in 20, 2008 that's when i took the first dip into this uh, you know this whole uh, sort of uh, you know process of learning clinical research this was my first workshop and uh, you know i really wasn't you know wasn't very happy so i went to cmc velour in 2010 and did a one week training course i wanted to learn more so i went to the wilmer i institute and i did more than a year's training there uh, you know overall learnings along the way have been you know you must know a bit about biostatistics uh, you may or may not learn how to do it but it's a good idea now that a lot of data analytics are coming in you probably it's not you know it's just a step wise process you can learn medical writing it is uh, you know it is an art and the more you do it the better you get and now i'm on the other, other side of things on, on the editorial hot seat with igo and i'm still learning you know so uh, you need to keep have uh, have that hunger of keep learning keep evolving uh, you can get trained in basics concepts you know there are a lot of technology which courses are available online there are hundreds of students sometimes thousands of students taking courses at the same time uh, you know you can also choose your you know which course you want to do uh, so you know you can actually sort of do these things uh, relatively easily now you know we'll get to the actual topic of why i actually want to do this and you know what's in it for me isn't it so uh, you know work that remains unpublished in one form or another is essentially incomplete or undone and uh, you know as we know a lot of you know a lot of theses happen in india or 600 theses happen every year uh, less than 10% of them are getting published uh, we've done a study on uh, papers which are you know uh, presented at an aios conference Uh, when you look back uh, at them after 5 years you'll see about 12% are actually published in journals that's really low isn't it so more than imagine 9 out of 10 papers are not making it to journals so people are uh, sort of uh, you know not taking that final step or the final hurrah of getting it into a major journal and you know there's a lot of reasons we could discuss uh, on and on about you know, there being not enough novelty uh, you know the design is poor uh, there is not enough training in the faculty and residents there is general apathy uh, and uh, poor enthusiasm and people are not uh, always aware of the benefits that uh, you know research can get uh, so this is what i told you uh, the aioc is about 12% if you look at other continental meetings it's about 30% and if you look at international meetings like the aao the ro more than 60% actually make it to publication over the next 5 years so you know i think we need to sort of uh, gear up and do this better uh <clears throat> you know i think it's important to also understand that doing research is like going beyond uh, one patient you know and you can really improve yourself uh you know i have sort of made a mnemonic about why you should do this it's easy to remember you know the mnemonic is famous and don't take it literally but you know sort of the out outline for f is fame and recognition because you know meaningful research makes impacts and can gain you peer respect fame and recognition Uh, then comes patient care where you know some of your pivotal research studies have potential to enhance patient care and thereby influence millions of lives you know that can that can really happen and uh, you know there are a lot of examples in india as well and uh, you know when i was I, a quick anecdote i'll share is you know when i was uh, training at the johns hopkins school of public health you know that their tag line is saving lives millions at a time 
and you know i was uh, sort of i thought you know this is an exaggeration and that you know the americans are always uh, you know trying to sell their courses but uh, you know as i went through i realized that you know they have uh, revamped the uh, you know vaccination schedules for egypt you know they are the ones behind eradicating trachoma almost and i have actually interacted with some people like that so and they are actually saving lives millions at a time and that is true and so probably we might not have that kind of impact but still you know you are uh, something new that you are doing may impact a lot of uh, you know children or adults with a particular disease uh, uh, you know m stands for making yourself a good clinician i think there are a lot of deliberations which happen when you submit a paper you get a review from uh, you know somebody uh you know and you try and think about this more and then you become a better thinker and finally all this uh, sort of funnels into you being a good clinician you know so you may be able to deal with complex situations uh, much better than somebody else or you may be able to figure out a, a hidden etiology uh, much better than someone else you know so that analytic mind starts building uh, in you you start asking questions in each and every patient and that overall makes you a much better clinician sometimes your papers can influence policy decisions uh i'll give you some examples of some of these uh you know so you know some papers can actually impact uh, how the government is spending uh based on you know what you have published uh then you can have funding and grants which are uh, available uh, if you are doing some good research and there are i'll show you some examples of how you can apply for these and then overall it's you know it's the personal index and that really means citations of your papers and you know the the sort of scientific word is the h index and you can go to google scholar and look at your own h index uh, real time uh, but uh, overall you know your citations of your papers help your personal growth and prestige in the medical community so and these are some of the important reasons or at least six most important reasons why you should publish let's take some of the examples from uh, you know from my own journey uh, so this is one paper in at the bottom these are uh, you know uh, uh, caterpillar hair which have gone inside the uh, uh, you know in the vitreous cavity or in the retina so we were looking at uh, you know finding risk factors for penetration of this caterpillar hair right into the eye and we found that if you hair see a hair and whether you see this pathology enough in bangalore but we used to see a lot when i was doing my residency in pondicherry so uh, you know when we when you see a hair in the cornea uh, there is a eight times higher chance of there being a hair in the posterior segment and believe me i have gotten emails from almost all continents saying that uh, you know uh, an italian ophthalmologist wrote that she found that in her uh, uh, daughter's eye and uh, you know i've gotten emails from everywhere saying that you know yes this happens and this is true and you know, so these are not citations this is not going to be in in literature but then you know it really makes you feel that uh, that you have gone beyond one patient and that you know it has probably impacted a lot of patients and places where they see this disease this is another example uh, of another paper that we published on uh, intraocular pressure reduction after uh, phaco versus uh, small incision cataract surgery so you know these are this was a randomized trial of course so uh, what we you know sort of the hypothesis was that pressure drops after phaco because of uh, you know the ultrasound energy which is ap- acting on the trabecular meshwork but then we found that you know intraocular pressure drops even in phaco multiplication so ultrasound probably has nothing to do with uh, so that dogma was challenged that uh, that thought process that ultrasound energy is responsible for the drop in iop was not true right and then after this paper actually some uh, labs which were doing research on this and had uh, had their nih funding revoked because of this paper you know so it can actually uh, go to that that extent uh sometimes you can have uh, a large influence on how literature is evolving in, over a particular disease you know so this was a paper which looked at toxic anterior segment syndrome which can happen after cataract surgery especially in a high volume setting so we looked at long term outcomes uh, you know and we had about 70 or 80 eyes overall where we followed up for one year you know so this is a relatively it's a, of course a uncommon condition but you know this is a large number of patients and followed up for a good number of time and a lot of people said there is endothelial decompensation and you know, there is intractable glaucoma but we didn't see any of these uh, fortunately uh, you know so me and my co-authors have actually reviewed a lot of papers uh, on toxic anterior segment syndrome over the years this is just one example of a paper that i uh, reviewed in 2019 you know this paper was published in 2012 or 2011 so over the decade or so me and my colleagues would have really reviewed a lot of papers uh, and then you know how uh, you know how a literature has evolved over time for toxic anterior segment syndrome might have a bearing uh, and our thought process might have an impact on that you know so that can all happen over time uh, uh, you know sometimes uh, you you know if you are a resident you want to go abroad you want to do more fellowships uh you know sometimes ivy league residency programs in the us and uk uh, mandate that you have publications and if you see this study you know if you look at some of the applicants in the uh, most uh, ivy league schools the, the mean number of publications was 
and even before getting into ophthalmology residency so and if you're looking for uh, uh, an ICO fellowship or something uh, to go and do abroad you know this is something that you really need to have as well so overall I've given you some examples of you know how this goes so uh, go home with questions ask questions learn from every patient they are your best teachers keep in touch with literature a uh, caveat is to uh, sort of you know subscribe to the e table of contents of some of the top journals in your field like uh, you know for us it's ophthalmology jam ophthalmology AJO uh, BGO and others and maybe one or two subspecialty journals like retina or cornea uh, you know maintain records uh, maintain registers uh, maybe use some apps uh, you know so that you can keep tracking patients over time uh, you know so this was basically why you want to do research from an academic point of view uh, remember that the onus is really on us because 90% of the world population lives in the developing world while 90% papers are published from the developed world right so the huge dis disparity and then the onus is really on us to to correct this uh, also, you know, that going beyond one patient really uh, is, uh, you know, what you mean is by doing meaningful work, you know, just having numbers and uh, chasing, uh, you know, writing too many letter to editors and, uh, and ophthalmic images and case reports, probably not the best deal. And you, know, you need to work on original articles, that is what is meaningful work. Uh, uh, you know, so overall, uh, you know, these are some of the academic reasons why you would want to publish. Uh, I would also like to touch upon uh, you know something which is you know people say publish and flourish you know a lot of people would say oh all is well and good but I want to make money I mean I am in the surgical field and uh, you know can I do that by being good at research there is an ever increasing desire to do scientific and clinical research and get published in the developing world come to Sengupta Research Academy e-learning portal and see how easy it can be to design and conduct a study analyze data write it up and publish by following a stepwise tried and tested approach. Learn, enjoy, spread the message and don't miss out on this great opportunity. You know, so, uh, you know, think of research or clinical research as investing in mutual funds. You know, it, if you do invest over a long period of time, you know, you can leverage it uh, and you can actually do whatever you want. You know, so if you uh, want a good, be good at academics, you can be, uh, you know, if you want to earn a good amount of money, you can also do that. And I'll show you some examples through my own, uh, own journey. Uh, so, you know, we'll talk a little bit about commercial aspects of uh, clinical research. Uh, yeah. So, you know, these are some of the things I wish I knew when I was starting research and that, you know, these, all these could happen and then I probably might have started much earlier. So, <clears throat> you know, as we all know, clinical practice, of course, can be most more lucrative. Uh, acquiring strong fundamentals and research techniques is critical right from the beginning. So build up your research skills from the residency days if possible, but, you know, it's never too late to start. Uh, but you need to be, you know, have some basic knowledge about how to do a good PubMed search. You need to have, uh, may not be mastery, but at least do a basic uh, literature review. Uh, again, biostatistics, some basics are essential. Uh, you need to understand how to communicate with the biostatistician and it will happen as you go along. Manuscript writing, again, you know, you can follow some basic templates. It's not really difficult. Uh, and you need to understand how to deal with rejections. They are not uh, the end of it. You know, you can learn from some of the mistakes that have been pointed out and make your paper better. The problem overall is that you, you've never been taught, right? So, you know, this is really, uh, I think this is how I felt when I was in early part of my residency and, you know, people used to say, oh, this p-value is this and this mean is that. Uh, you know, you were never taught formally at all in medical school and then when you enter residency or fellowship, you really want to learn more of clinical skills and, you know, all of this really goes into the background. Only when you come out is when you realize that, uh, you know, oops, I missed a chance. So, uh, you know, assuming that we have become slightly good at research, you know, so, uh, what are the commercial angles or you know what are the avenues for uh, revenue generation uh, through this is what we'll talk uh, in the next five minutes you know so this is a summary slide we'll get get back to this you know i think first and foremost research grants and funding are uh, are uh, an avenue where uh, you know uh, where uh, you can gen generate some income uh, so it's impossible to get is really <coughs> a wrong perception you know where to look for is something that we really don't know we can probably have a whole session on uh, grand craft or you know something like that but you know quickly where to look for is there are some icmr has extramural grants so extramural is outside the uh, icmr you know so intramural is within so you can look at the icmr uh, extramural grants look at the dbt or dst websites trialect is another agency which alerts about grants and international fellowships 
So this is the sort of uh, you know uh, screenshot of the website of the ICMR extramural research program. You know these are some of the requirements, and uh, you know some of, some grants can go till about fifty thousand or even one lakh, and can be recurring. Uh, you know this is the website called Trial Act, like I said. You know so you can easily make you can log in and make a free uh, sort of profile there, and uh, you know I I'd say the active opportunities you can host a traineeship or a colleagueship, and you can also even get uh, alerts for uh, you know international. uh fellowship programs so that is something that you should definitely have an account on second is multi center clinical trial participation is now getting lucrative so you know all ingredients for rcts are there in india you know as we know there are lots of patients there are lots of doctors there are regulations in play, place there are clinical research organizations and global pharma definitely recognize this this you know as we go along so uh, imagine johns hopkins has large offices in delhi and in pune and they are doing a lot of studies on anti hiv medications tuberculosis and etc so there are many institutions which are already part of part of large global clinical trials including some in ophthalmology and there are remunerations offered for your participation so you need to train yourself publish and have an ethics committee and this is one of the large uh you know uh, phase 4 studies called the luminous study for use of ranibizumab in uh, eye diseases and if you see india is also figuring in that so that means there are a lot of people who are contributing uh you know to these kind of studies uh then you can be a consultant speaker or advisory to pharma this is highly prevalent in the western world as we all know uh you know research oriented clinicians are paid very well in their capacity as uh, as such as speakers advisors and consultants and you know many physicians also hold equity you know so this is uh, this is something that i uh, learned in 2018 where the harvard professor made 400 million dollars in biotech companies ipo so i'm not saying you have to get into that kind of uh, thing but you know uh, getting involved and you know being a, a speaker and you're getting remunerated for your efforts is is something that you can also look at uh you know then you can serve as an expert in market surveys uh, you know so when companies are launching uh, new products uh, you can you know you may be come in, you know you may be uh, sort of contacted and uh, remember that they will contact only some of the top uh, you know they call them kols or key opinion leaders and companies will contact key, key opinion leaders and you know field as market survey to about 50 or 60 uh, say top ophthalmologists and you know they will ask you very simple questions uh you know companies will do this before launching any new drugs or instruments uh, intraocular lenses etc uh they usually target the top bar, top brass and you know a strong research based linkedin profile i think is a really good initiation uh so you know you should do that also enroll your name in maven which is another database i'll show you some examples so this is the maven you know previously i showed you to trial act this is maven you know so this is again uh these are websites which uh, you know do uh, large surveys across the world in maven is there there's one more called glc so you might want to take a look at these you know when you log in you have to put in your expertise accordingly if there is a survey which matches your expertise and don't think that i have not done enough works but then you know you, if you just put your profile there maybe the, it will get hits uh you know so uh, like i said they are really easy you know simple questions like which logo would you prefer to costing of the product to how would you perceive latest medical evidence of its efficacy how likely you are to adopt it in your own practice so these are some of the important questions which are there and they are easy for you they are very important for the people who are actually conducting the survey and all the top surveys pay quite well for your time you know so i have been part of uh, multiple surveys this is one where uh you know the the non disclosure has actually expired so this is why i am able to put this on on the screen so this was done in 2015 you know so this is by ernst and young uh, so, you know this is the their life science department which was doing this kind of survey you can collaborate with other academia it's uh, you know it's immensely pleasurable and a great learning experience you know other academia not in medicine but it could be finance market research health tech research you know i have been involved with uh, my own personal experiences with a top business school in india that's based in mumbai and we i helped design a market survey to find out how physicians would respond you know physicians like you and me would respond if medical representatives are replaced by digital marketing strategies you know so i mean you would get to see uh, a, say a sun pharma product or a, say another product on your mobile device and you know what would be the best way to present it and you know how will the uptake be whether email is better or twitter is better on you know things like that so i sat through a lot of meetings i contributed as a physician how would i perceive it i learned a lot as well and then you know there's there, there was a good very uh, large uh, sort of remuneration for these kind of things 
you can offer your services to other physicians you know publication assistance for a fee is now you know growing not only in india but uh, you know large parts of the world like you know people in the middle east people in uh, in south america people in china who are not very good at uh, speaking english they want a lot of assistance there's a lot of uh, you know these are all very valuable if you can deliver high quality manuscripts consistently and like i said there is a huge uh, demand now for these kind of things so i am sure of all of you have heard about my academy and you know i uh, me and my team offer these kind of services but then you know it's it's uh, it's not proprietary anyone can do that so if you're good at it think about doing this as well you know so my academy we have done papers for a lot of organizations and uh, you know so and we continue to do uh, similar work uh, <clears throat> you know you can also be part of expert panels for agencies like the icmr or uh, you know i have a personal experience of being on the review board of the hong kong research council grant review board which is something similar to uh, icmr you know this is good remuneration and uh, you know those grants that they are applying for are their national grants you know so they are like a million us dollars or 2 million us dollars you know so you are asked to uh, referee on these grants and see whether they you know it all makes sense and you know of course you and there will be many other referees and if all of them say yes that grant will be passed you know so uh so th there's a lot of responsibility on on your shoulders as well you can review papers and earn you know these are these are new uh, avenues which are coming up uh, there are open access journals which want credibility now uh, a lot of them are outsourcing their manuscripts for review and you know there are agencies doing this called research square is one of them you know so you can actually go to their website and actually again create uh, your own profile and you know you can connect it with uh, research uh, gate and pub launch and then you know Uh, that agency knows that you know you have been an author and you have been reviewing for so many years, and then they pay somewhere between fifty and hundred US dollars per paper reviewed. You know, so imagine if you review like five or six papers, maybe sometimes ten papers a month. You know, that's uh, that's pretty good uh, revenue from this source as well. You can also assist vent venture capital firms. There's a tremendous interest in Indian healthcare startups. Uh, you know, government is also investing. There are large venture capital funds like Sequoia or Nexus Ventures, which are heavily investing in India. you know but then they have the money but then they are not uh, content experts isn't it so they don't know whether uh, this is going to make sense so should i invest is what their whole question is and is this idea good enough for me to invest that uh, million dollars so this is called vetting you know so they want content experts for vetting these ideas and if you know a medical startup can be vetted by a medical doctor isn't it but then not everybody has that kind of uh, profile who will be able to do this so you know if you have been good at research publications you know you've been uh, you know part of many different sort of multifaceted teams you know your name is going to figure so you know i have done this for uh, nexus ventures uh, you know and i have seen that vetting process first hand you know so you will be considered as a subject expert and these kind of opportunities may come your way as well and the remuneration is quite handsome in these two but you know there were a lot of work but then you know this is uh, something else that you can do so overall you know research grants and funding are there multi centered trial participations uh, consultant speakers and advisory for pharma world serve as an expert in market surveys collaborate with other academia uh, then offer your research related services to physicians act as expert panel for agencies like the icmr or you know many others review papers and earn so research square is is the is the main one doing that and you can assist venture capital firms uh, in analyzing proposals as well i think you know keep learning is really important you know and that word earn is actually part of that word learn you know so if you keep learning then uh, you know you will definitely you know up the ante and your earning potential also keeps increasing so think about doing something more than just patient care if you're if you're not uh, uh, you know thinking and you know this is uh, another uh, sort of clip which i really am inspired by which is from the movie three idiots it says bachcha kabil bano kabil kamyabi piche bhagegi you know so Uh, <clears throat> so that really means seek, seek excellence and success will follow uh, you know so in whatever you're doing i think it's important to sort of do that and uh, you know we are all in our comfort zones but the magic really happens outside that so move out of your comfort zone do things you know you may do silly things you may feel awkward in the beginning but then you know slowly and surely you will start getting good at at these things so i think take home messages enjoy clinical research learn from it you can earn by doing it as well and you know we already looked at some of the academic aspects in the past so uh, you know the, the academic aspects have been uh, are there in many places this is one article which was published in 2014 and you know this uh, on november 2014 it's available online of course this is my research academy where you know there are a lot of 
courses. I won't go into too much details, but you know, there's a nice course on biostatistics and manuscript writing. Uh, so if you want, you can actually try and you know enroll in some of these. And there's a footprint of uh, there are about 4,500 students uh, from 87 countries enrolled in these courses. So you know, it's helping uh, a lot of people do this. Also, you know, there are a lot of blogs on say you know p-values, regressions, uh, uh, how to convert your thesis to a journal article, sample size, and and so many others. So I think there are about 37, 38 uh, different blogs. So you can take a look at those as well. Uh, also, you know, I run a, a podcast which uh, plays on Spotify, so you can actually take a look at that as well. So, you know, I'm happy to take questions now or later, and, uh, you know, and thank you so much for this opportunity. I think fantastic, uh, uh, Sunny, you took uh, publishing to another level itself. I think for most of us, it is just getting our name on uh, PubMed, but you've given us so many more uh, avenues and so many more uh, you know opportunities uh, i'll hang so please questions if any you should uh, ask uh, because sunny is extremely approachable and he's uh, already given you so many more uh, uh, reasons why you should publish so any of you all have any uh, basic doubts also please do go ahead and uh, ask him. over to you dr sanjay uh, i think it was a excellent uh, presentation it actually opened a new world out there so it's not just your name being there uh, my ex boss used to always say, begin with an end in mind. So just presenting papers in the conference won't do any good. You have to turn all those things into a publication. And as you showed, there are many avenues to actually earn from your uh, publications. So that's a good thing uh, to actually uh, take forward. The other thing is, uh, how much time in a clinical setup would you give for a research purpose? Because nowadays we are all busy, we are flooded with uh, patients, especially in this uh, post-COVID scenario. How much time do you think we can allot for research? So I think, uh, you know, even in some of my lectures, I've said before, doing about 45 minutes a day, I think is pretty good enough, you know. So uh, sometimes half an hour a day is also good enough. So that adds up to three hours uh, a week. You know, I think that's plenty time for uh, even for somebody who is starting out. And, you know, if you really dedicated to that, even if you do, you know, say half an hour, four days a week, that's two hours. And, you know, so over a month, actually, your whole paper should be done. I mean, it's not really that difficult, provided you have a statistician uh, who's going to back you up. So, you know, I think that half an hour a day is, is all that it takes. But that, you know, that mind has to be uncluttered. Your phone has to be switched off at the time. You're not going to do anything else. You know, so it's, it's like that. So. Uh, that half an hour of very dedicated time is better than uh, even a half a whole, a half a day or a whole day with your with your clinic. So, I think that that is more than enough. Uh, when, when I actually started uh, doing my research, my boss used to say that uh, the low hanging fruits are the letters to editor. So you don't need to do much. So you can just read somebody one somebody's article. Then you contemplate what you can do. What, what you can critique about it and uh, start off with it. Do you think it's a good idea for a new 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 P to actually start off with it? No, so, uh, you know, I would never uh, encourage somebody to write too many letters to editors, you know. So once you have, say, 10 publications, uh, maybe two or three letters are okay. But if, when you have 50 publications and you have uh, 30 letters, that, that definitely doesn't look good on your CV. So, you know, letter to editors may be low fruit, but then, you know, that's just to get you started, isn't it? So one or two and you know that you should be motivated enough to start do, going to the next step you know so if you look at the you know the the pyramid of uh, evidence led to i mean you know animal experiments at the at, at the bottom and uh, you know rcts and meta analysis are at the top but then it's always good to start uh, you know with case reports and such but then by the time you are finishing you know that really should look like an erect building where you have equal numbers or maybe even that uh, you know that is reversed where uh, you know, you have more original articles and fewer case reports. So that's sort of a journey which, you know, it's not really a one-time thing, isn't it? But then starting with a letter is probably okay, but after a few, I think it, it, it's probably not such a great idea. Remember that you're actually critiquing too many work, right? So it's never a good idea to keep criticizing and not showing up yourself. So I think that's, that's my take on it. Um, the other uh, challenge for a beginner is uh, getting the case reports published. Now, uh, luckily, we have uh, Indian General of Ophthalmology case reports. Prior to that, uh, we had uh, very few opportunities for uh, case reports. And uh, whichever case reports were there, there was a challenge of uh, this article processing charges. 
So how do we go about even uh, give a case report charges for uh, color and photos? So how does a beginner actually tackle all this? Because there is not uh, adequate uh, funding available. You know, so you know, that word case report uh, really means starting from the you know from the manifestations to how you made the diagnosis to how you treated it and then you know what happened at the last follow up and you know essentially the whole journey is documented. However, you can actually take pieces of this and you know how you diagnosed. And that may be the only part of the article which is of interest, you know. So, just one or two scans and one or two laboratory investigations could actually make up a photo essay. Or, you know, so what I'm trying to say is that whole journey can be broken down into images, into uh, photo essays, into the whole uh, case report, and sometimes a case series. Now, remember that you know that case report word is a taboo for most journals because they don't get cited, so the journals don't want to publish it. You know, but then there are journals like Ophthalmology who publishes perspectives. You know, that, that word is not case report, it's called perspectives and it has a 300 word limit and it, you can have one or two images in that. So you can publish a case report in the form of a perspective in ophthalmology. Uh, JAMA ophthalmology has something called ophthalmic image, you know, so that publishes every month, you know, so even sometimes two every month. So uh, JAMA ophthalmology also does publish uh, some of these, you know, it's important to remember that these are the ones which draws readership. It may not draw citations and uh, impact factors but these are the ones which draw readership so journals don't want to totally uh, you know get rid of this uh, however then uh, you know uh, keeping the word count below 300 uh, having less than five references means that that paper becomes non-citable it is a non-citable item you know so it does not count even for impact factor calculation so that's why uh, you know journals are now changing from case reports to other smaller forms of communication which are only online and they have restrictions, but then you can still get into it. You know, New England Journal of Medicine also publishes, uh, you know, images, and uh, so does Lancet. So, almost all top journals, if you dig enough, and if you, you know, if you have subscribed to the e table of contents and others, uh, you will see that there are some of these categories as well. So, try and look at journals and all the categories which are there, and you may find that you know some of them may actually be suitable. So, uh, you know, keep trying, and you can actually get in some of these. The other uh, problem would be the cost. So if we do have uh, images, how do we uh, fund these? No, that's right. So all these journals that I said, uh, they are all published only online and there are no charges for that. You know? So uh, almost all of these are uh, free. So ophthalmology or uh, JAMA ophthalmology. You know, and if, if your article is not, you know, if your case report is not making into some of these very top uh, journals, there are chances that it is almost never going to be read. You know, so uh, there are some uh, you know image data banks which are there. You know, say the ASRS has a large data bank, and you can uh, or an image bank. You know, so you can actually upload some images there. The ASCRS also has one like that. So, you know, so every time that image is used somewhere, you are going to get uh, sort of a. It's not a citation. All images have a DOI that is you know digital identifier number. So. Uh, you know, all that is then uh, linked to something called Publons. You know, Publons is the one which actually is a repository which keeps track of your papers, your citations, your, uh, uh, you know, ORCID is another one. So all of these are all getting together now. So if your, uh, you know, image is getting cited by someone else, by another journal, say, or it is being used on uh, by a, a writing agency, you're going to get kind of citations for those. So it also makes sense to think about whether, you know, your images are good for, a, for an, an, an image bank. If not, you know, then you'll have to look at slightly lower tier journals for your paper, you know, like uh, you know, there are these Middle Eastern journal, Nepalese journal, and so many others. And uh, like you said, of course, there are journals which are publishing for a fee. So, you know, I think it's important to remember that you should watch out for predatory journals. So don't submit to a journal and you think, oh, I'll pay and I'll publish, but then, you know, that journal may not. So always try and publish in a indexed journal. And that by that, I mean PubMed indexed. Uh, you know, but then if you have to pay a fee and there is no other way, so be it. Also think about, uh, you know, sending these for some state association journals like the Delhi Journal or the, uh, you know, the Kerala Journal, the Tamil Nadu Journal, now also the Karnataka Journal. Uh, there are a lot of them are getting revamped and they're doing really well, you know. So who knows, in five, six years, they may actually become permit index. So that is also something that you should think about. So uh, there, are, there are other, uh, as you mentioned uh, correctly, there are a lot of these uh, predatory journals which actually spam your email box. So if a beginner actually starts uh, seeing them, probably they might be influenced uh, trying uh, for some publication at least using uh, those predatory journals. Is there a way we can actually stop these predatory journals or they are just going to proliferate? 
No, so I think uh, you know if you're getting uh, if you're getting such emails, that means you have already submitted at least five or six times somewhere or the other. You may not have published. You know, it may just be in process or in uh, in review or something like that. But uh, that means you know people have actually got access to your email and your name. Uh, you know, so these are coming means you already are. You may not be a prolific author, but you already are an author. You know, so then what you need to understand that you have to differentiate these from. uh the actual journals you know so look at the publisher look at who is the editor uh you know look at whether it's being published by a, a scientific society or it's just a stand alone journal and most importantly is this pubmed indexed you know so if it's an indexed journal a lot of this headache is taken care of by the indexing service itself you know so uh, other things like that does it publish at least four issues every year is it only online or is does it have a print in circulation you know what is the readership like uh you know things like that so you will be able to figure out that you know this is something fishy or and then there are some publishers uh which are also fishy you know say bentham uh, publishers are one and then there are so many now which have proliferated and also there are some indian publishers which are doing this as well so but then you know i've given already some six or seven pointers which will help you differentiate uh, you know predatory journals from the authentic ones but then i don't think we can actually stop them legally or you know it's just a business model open access is different from predatory you know so igo is an open access journal open access just means that the readership doesn't have to pay to read that article uh, which is true for uh, predatory as well you know but uh, where uh, article processing fees is being paid by the author isn't it but then uh, so there is a fine line between it being predatory versus it being open access so there is something that you need to sort of figure out uh, dr anuj has a question dr anuj go ahead Uh, yes sir as an editor i wanted to ask you what is it that you look at in a paper like um, how do you read papers like do you go to the abstract and to the discussion straight or how do uh, editors judge papers yeah <clears throat> i think that's a great question and you know when you're re- reviewing like 50 papers a week yeah i think when you're reviewing say 50 papers a week that that is a very important question to look at and first and foremost is uh, you know we look at the abstract very carefully and whether it's written uh, well or not and that gives a fair idea of uh, you know whether there is some substance to the paper or not so remember that a poorly written abstract is one of the major reasons for a table rejection where it doesn't even go to a peer review you know so uh, i have actually a blog on uh, you know five things that you should take care when you write an abstract but then you know say for example uh, you uh, say uh you know intraocular pressure reduced uh in the same way in drug a and drug b suppose that's a study that you're writing and you you just give a p value but then you know you need to give that intraocular pressure in change say it dropped by 4 mm in group a and 5 mm in group b or whatever that may be so that metric has to be given isn't it so that is your primary outcome at least so you know there are few other things which need to be taken care of while you're writing uh, an abstract say when you're writing the methods you need to use that pico approach where p is for participants so you give inclusion exclusion uh, i is for uh, you know the intervention that has been done the c is for the control group and o is for outcome measures so you know if the abstract has the pico approach the the results have the results have uh, you know what the primary outcome was supposed to and then you know we go into the introduction and i read the last line of the introduction which actually should be the lacuna or the gap in literature of that this has not been done and this that's why i am trying to do it or what is the novelty in the paper that has to be part of the introduction you know so uh, you know that a poor abstract and uh, a, a lack of the gap in literature is a straight rejection straight away uh you know once i am through and i am i have come beyond the introduction then i generally don't read it we send it out for a review so i think and you know then it all really depends on the review comments and you know how the introduction happens how authors respond to that but the first and foremost how editors read it basically are is this worth sending out for a peer review isn't it so couple of things of course is you know, that this is not going to be of interest to our readership or you know there is this is just too mundane and there is nothing new and there is the journal is too competitive now so we can't spend too much resources uh, into reviewing this paper and then uh, you know we look at the title and we say ah this looks new this is something different this is octa a in you know say uh, xyz disease but then you know if the red paper then we look at the actual content and the abstract and the end of the introduction and after that you know the decision is made so i think that's how most editors would would probably do it as well uh doctor okay, you have a question doctor yash oh uh, yes sir 
Sir, I wanted to ask uh, how much of biostatistics uh, uh, should a beginner know? So, what we learned in our uh, third year, is it good enough? Or uh, should we be learning more of biostatistics to do it by ourselves? See, so <clears throat> knowing statistics and doing statistics yourself are two entirely different things. First and foremost, you don't have to do statistics yourself, you know, because uh, that's quite a tedious activity and uh, needs a lot of training. So doing statistics is probably not such a great idea and, you know, you have better things to do. Uh, but then, you know, uh, what tests you want to get done or, uh, you know, so essentially what you need to understand is how that Excel is going to look as the results of, a, of your paper, isn't it? That Excel has to make a journey to the results of your paper. So you need to visualize your data in a way that, you know, so what are the, what part of my data is going to go into tables? What part of my data is going to go into figures? And then what is the rest which is going to go into text? Okay, now uh, to go into tables, you need to have, you know, say comparisons, etc. So what are the tests that you would like to be done for you to get, you know, so it's good idea to make a blank table and say, you know, the first column is basically all the variables that you want to, <coughs> you know, say, uh, compare, say age, and say it's group A and group B, and then a p-value. So if age is a, uh, is a continuous variable, what is the test of significance that should be used? It's something that you should know, you know. So there's some basic, you know, that will help you uh, interpret that, uh, what the statistician sends as well. Statisticians are in the habit of usually sending you, uh, you know, a, an export uh, Word document from SPSS, or from Stata, or from SAS, or whatever. And then that is entirely impossible to understand, you know. So that will be like a 50, 60 page word document with 10 font or 8 font, very small. And you will not make any head nor tail of that, you know. So uh, sending blank tables to a statistician is generally a good idea. So what I'm trying to say is learn how, learn statistics or learn basics of biostatistics so that it helps you visualize your data well. Uh, you know, and then basics of what tests should be used. And then you can actually tell the statistician that this is my primary outcome. And this is what I'm looking for and these are the groups I want to compare you across. Uh, this is the regression I want to use and you know this is how the uh, final uh, tables and figures should look like. So even if you are able to do that, you know, so for that, uh, you know, for some very basics are generally more than good enough. You don't have to do the t-test, but you should know that the t-test is needed for this kind of statistics. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more thing for the beginners. How do you uh, get a research question? So you're in a busy clinic. So how do you get a research question? On what topic should I do research? How do I collect data? How do you go about doing those things? Yes, yeah, so I think <clears throat> there are you know two ways of looking at it. One is you already have a question in mind. You know, it probably is from your clinic or something that you're observing, which is not very frequent. So, uh, you know, that, oh, this is a side effect of this drug and I'm seeing some, you know, crystals on the retina or, you know, whatever that may be. And that causality association is something that you're looking for. So you're beginning with a study question, isn't it? So then has this been done in the past? Is there any literature on that? So that will come by doing a good PubMed search. Now, you know, what if you don't have any question in mind? It's just a blank slate, but you have a lot of data uh, and you want to do something with it. So you need to find gaps in literature which have not been done, isn't it? So then you need to zero in on uh, at least a specialty of your choice. Could just be cataract surgery. And then uh, you need to read some, you know, some journals which are publishing your niche kind of uh, work. Uh, so if you don't want to, uh, you know, uh, read it all at once, you can, like I said, pub subscribe to the e-table of contents. So say every month a uh, journal of cataract and refractive surgery, say journal of refractive surgery, or these two or three major ones or whatever you are interested in, they will send their table of contents to your email box. You know, so every month you will see at least 30 or 40 topics. Uh, you may not open it at all, you know, or you may open and you may see the title. And you can click and read the abstract as well. Sometimes there are free articles to read. But then, you know, even looking at those 30, 40 uh, titles will give you, start giving you ideas, you know. So that is uh, another way of sort of you know, thinking about what you can do with uh, the data that you're sitting on. Uh, other thing is uh, access to journals. Uh, being uh, in an institution, we may not uh, have access to all journals and uh, many of the articles are not free. So how do we go about uh, trying to get these articles? Sometimes you can do write to the authors to actually share their articles to research gate, but sometimes it's not possible. If you want to, as you said, uh, if you have a research question, trying to find gaps and uh, you want some articles, but it's not available. How do we go about doing this? See, there is no magic bullet to doing this that, uh, oh, I have this magic site and that I'll get. But then Sci-Hub is one that you can actually look at. So you know, there's a lot of papers before 2019, before they were taken to court, 
but then sci hub is uh, is one s c i dash h u b you can just google it uh, so sky hub or sci hub and you know you can get a lot of full texts which are uh, lodged on that server there uh, then of course you know the one network or the o n e network from the a o is a really good uh, site and a i o s members have free access to one network <coughs> you know so where all your major journals ophthalmology a j o b j o all of those are available survey ophthalmology uh, you know many many are there at least i think there are eight or nine journals which you know if you want to read some article and find a an actual gap you better read some of the best journals right so almost all of that is available on uh, on uh, the one network or the one network and uh, you know there is a website called i planet which is being run by sun pharma uh, so you know you can talk to some of the sun pharma representatives and get your uh, login credentials there and what's uh, you know i planet is doing is tying up with walter's clover you know so uh, they are the ones who are so that is called the ovid uh, gateway and what they are doing is publishing most of these sub specialty journals you know so cornea glaucoma journal of glaucoma retina retina cases brief reports uh, orbit most of these are being published by uh you know this uh, walter's clover so uh, those sub specialty journals you can actually get uh, access from i planet so you know one network i planet and sci hub i think 90% of what you are looking for is covered there but then uh, you know of course if you can have a uh, you know if your library is, has access you know that, that really helps so the other thing uh, what pgs uh, probably faces how do they, do they convert their uh, thesis into a publication because they would have put in a lot of effort but uh, finally it doesn't uh, see the light of the day how do they go about doing this first and foremost is you know that's not enough effort if it is not seeing the light of day it is not enough effort if there is enough effort it will get through but then there is not enough effort uh, then uh, you know there are differences between how a thesis article looks like uh, a thesis paper looks like and you know we need a lot of time to discuss these i have a blog on this so you can actually take a read that but then you know if a thesis is well done uh, extracting a paper out of it is really easy but if a thesis is not well done then it's impossible so do your thesis well write it well take pains and have an eye out for publication even when you are doing it even when you are writing it you know every day you need to think about it otherwise it will not happen that enough effort is not going to come in so so sort of the take home message is uh, you know right from choosing the thesis topic to actually gathering your patient data to analyzing it to writing your thesis everything has to be in sync with that one goal of publishing the paper and not just getting it through to dnb or to ms or whatever Uh, probably one of the last questions how do you deal with the uh, rejections of uh, paper you have had a few rejections do you just uh, dump it in the dustbin or uh, you persist no so there are some you know people who have talked about you know working on a paper for like 20 attempts or like you know, 21 attempts so there is no upper limit to how many attempts you can put on one paper but then you know you need to first acknowledge that oh there is something you know something wrong with my paper that it's getting rejected so that first thing is keep your ego aside you know because this pure science that the reviewer is talking about sometimes they don't know you sometimes they know you or at least you know know your name they probably don't know you as such but then uh, you know there is something wrong in the paper which is being highlighted so you know look at it from a third party angle you know say if you were not the author would you agree with those comments if yes uh, and most of the times it is you know so if you agree with the comments then you know that's it you you acknowledge that you know these are the lacuna in my paper and you try and revisit and you resurrect and then you rise again you know you submit to another journal but then uh, you know the problem is people don't want to put enough efforts to sort of you know sometimes you have to go back to like 300 files and uh, you know take a look at so oh, this is a parameter i forgot to measure so now you have to go back you know that's a lot of effort but then most people would chicken out isn't it so uh, that effort is important acknowledging that this is uh, that that comment is going to make my paper overall better is really important and remember that all these deliberations uh, you may think it's a lot of work but you know they are actually sitting in your subconscious mind and they are going to accumulate over a period of time when you start reviewing you are going to be a better reviewer and all this that is happening you know it's all working in your mind when you're when you're sleeping but then they are making you a much much better clinician overall so don't chicken out while trying to review don't take it as uh, a negative but it's actually a positive you know there are some journals who might actually review your paper you know say i have submitted a journal uh, paper to the new england journal of medicine and you know it has been rejected outright which is obvious but then one of my papers went through to review which is a huge thing you know once any gm reviewed it it got published in ophthalmology later on you know so 
uh, sometimes you know sending papers to two high ranking journals are are probably not the best way choose your journal advice you know uh, sort of uh, judiciously do your thesis well i think that's really important and uh, you know don't take rejections to heart uh, try and work on them and you know come back stronger okay one final question by dr anuj anuj uh yes sir i also wanted to ask how do you manage your references like do you use mendeley or zotero and also how do you save your papers meaning you must have read like hundreds and thousands of papers how have you saved your information that you've gathered through them and not lost your papers yeah so i use zotero personally but uh, you know you can use mendeley or zotero and uh, <clears throat> you know whenever uh, i'm writing a paper i'm taking notes on zotero so zotero allows you to take notes on every paper you know so when you open a paper uh, and it has a free pdf the zotero also downloads that pdf along with so you can open that pdf yes. in zotero itself and you can annotate on that itself or you can to take notes there itself you know say you say oh this sentence from the discussion is something that i can compare with so just note it down there you know so that page 3 line so and so is going to be used for my discussion later on uh so, you know so that is how i do it so most of the you know that stuff is within zotero itself uh you know all the archiving and all of that so i have a paid version of zotero because okay. it allows you 2 gb of space but then you know i have run out of 2 gb i don't know how long back so i have a premium version of zotero there's nothing different except for the space and uh, ability to collaborate with thousands of researchers uh, who might be you know so uh, if you have another person who's working say in in switzerland and another one who's sitting in japan another one who's sitting in buenos aires all of you can actually access the same set of references if you have a premium version of zotero so that is something that could help as you you know mature along but uh, i archive all papers in that uh, on zotero and uh, you know and lastly uh, actual word document that i am saving you know so I never save it as final you know that you know we will say oh this name and then yes. underscore final and then you will see oh yes sir oh then oh final one then it's final two and then it's final 30 and then it's final 6 yeah it just it just keeps going so i have had final 52 also so it can happen that way where there are a lot of co-authors and you know a lot of people are making changes at different times you are totally lost as to who said what uh, you know so uh, best way to label that word document is to use the date isn't it so first you write the year you know say so this is 22 so 22 today would be 220630 and then you say okay. you know what our name or you just say the name of the file and then underscore v1 that is version 1 or version 2 but then you know sometimes you will have three versions on the same day and then that can all be sort of confusing so uh, it's better to then use uh, you know the the date as the as the beginning of the name of the file and lastly always use uh, you know track changes on microsoft word if you're using that so that you know everything is there the original version is there different uh, author changes are there in different colors and it can all be traced back microsoft word versus google doc yeah so even google doc allows you that now where you can actually keep tracking you know who has made whatever changes so you know it's up to you microsoft word or google doc anyone works okay thank you are there any further questions from anybody in the audience if not uh, thank you so much uh, dr sen gupta it was uh, truly enlightening how to make money out of uh, research and uh, also make it uh, a pleasure business and also enrich your mind uh, thank you so much and uh, good night thank you thank you everyone it was a uh, real pleasure uh, you know being with all of you thank you so much all right. thank you thank you